Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. Um, welcome to the tech lunch for it should have been for April 2021, but uh, unfortunately, I had to delay that a little bit. Um, but happy that we can do it today. And today's tech lunch for the Harvest Fuel Initiative is about briquette drying. Um, so we've talked now, I think, about fuel composition and testing and standards and carbonization. And the last one was about binders. So this is an important topic. Um, oftentimes, I think a lot of producers uh, mentioned that drying is one of their bottlenecks, if not the biggest bottleneck, uh, prohibiting them from reaching a bigger scale. So what I'll do today is we're going to, one, we're going to talk about um, what is important in drying, what are the important processes at play, um, because I think it's good to get a little bit of background on the basics. <clears throat> and then the other thing that we'll do is we'll discuss several approaches and then some advantages and disadvantages of each of those. Um, and for that, I'll just show some examples of some briquette dryers that I've seen in use um, by different uh, businesses. You might recognize some of those. Hopefully it was okay to use those as an example. Uh, and then for the disadvantages and advantages, I think we can just have a discussion after the presentation about that. So um, first, how do things dry? And I, I think this is important because well, most people probably think that there's one main mode of drying and that's heat, right? So you have to get something hot in order for it to dry out. And that is one mode. So if you have a heat source, uh, let's say in this case, the sun, the sun is radiating a lot of heat onto the earth. Uh, here's our purple briquette or purple mass, wet mass. Um, so yeah, one mode is just to uh, create a heat source, say the sun, or it could be you know, a biomass fire, or you could have a microwave. People do actually drying even in microwaves. Um, uh, so what that would do is you're heating up your mass, a wet mass, and heating actually promotes drying. It promotes evaporation of water, right? Um, so also what it does is it heats the air around the wet mass, around the briquette. And we know that hotter air actually has a, a better capacity for carrying a, away water from wet things, right? Um, so there's some physics and thermodynamics that are behind that. I won't go into all of that, but we know hot drying with hot air and heating up our mass is a good thing when it comes to drying, but it's not the only thing. And actually it's maybe not even the most important thing. So the other thing is we need, number two, we need air flow. Um, so that's indicated by these arrows and I accidentally hit the button. So number three, we get uh, evaporation and uh, removal of moisture from our mass. But so an important one is that we actually have flow of air and not just any kind of air. Sorry. Um, not just any kind of air. We actually, ideally, we have flow of dry air, so low moisture air. But actually, um, unless your air is 100% humid, uh, most air with a lower humidity will have a good capability for drying. So we have a thermal component. We have what we call uh, convection or advection. Some people call it convective drying. And all of those result in a removal of moisture. And this is a, what we call a, an interface or a surface interaction, right? So we have moisture in the mass. We have relatively dry air passing over that with some, maybe aided by some heat source. Um, but the, the thing that really drives the drying here is what we call a con concentration gradient. And so that means that the concentration of water 
in our wet briquette is higher than the concentration of water in the air. And that'll generally be the case until your briquette is you know, quite dry. But that difference actually drives water to flow in the direction of lower concentration. So that's a little bit confusing, but um, that'll be important actually when we're talking about one of the uh, one of the drier designs. So as long as we're we're removing this moisture, taking it away, and introducing fresh air with low moisture, then we'll continue to to drive that drying process at the interface of the briquette and the air. So I know that's that's a little bit confusing, but we have two major modes. Uh, heat and then flow of uh, dry air, and that results in stage three uh, water removal by that concentration gradient. So I'm happy to you know speak more about that in detail, and we can even look at some of the the physics behind that if you're interested. But I think it's important to remember that these two both contribute. Um, to moisture removal and drying. So let's look at a, a few drier designs now that we have that in mind, right? We can look at a few designs through that lens of what, what it, in each of these, what is actually uh, driving uh, the drying process. And actually, I think in all of them, both are at play, but maybe um, in different strengths, each, each mode. So the one I think everybody is familiar with is just open sun drying. Um, so we have a couple of photos here from Uganda. Uh, we have our actually a student, uh, D-Lab student team was working on a drying project there. And so here, this is just uh, racks, you know, wire mesh. Uh, I think it's kind of more heavily supported um, wire and then thinner wire. And then wooden frame, wooden and metal frames, right? One of the issues often is that insects and moisture will kind of rot the wooden frames. So, in this case, they they upgraded to metallic frames supported by wood. And then, um, excuse me. <laughs> so. Um, Another thing that's in the air here right now is pollen, and that's affecting me a little bit. So um, you'll hear me sniffling and sneezing occasionally. But um, so the briquettes are placed out and they're in the open sun. Now, the downside of this is at some point in time, the rain starts to come. And in this case, they need to cover those with tarps or tarpaulins. And um, then you don't get much drying because you don't have much airflow you're actually trapping a lot of the moisture within the tarpaulin and you blocked off that thermal component the sun um, but in if you have enough space this is actually a pretty good way to dry we did some experiments looking at enclosed drying and using biomass to supplement it and having a you know solar thermal collector and the open air sun drying, as long as you had space, decent sunlight, and, a, and ideally a little bit of prevailing wind or you know, a regular steady breeze, if, if you could arrange it um, with the breeze a little bit, then uh, the, the open air drying was, was uh, significantly better than enclosed drying. So. That I think that was a uh, something that I didn't know, but we ran ran an experiment in Dar es Salaam to to determine that. Um, another type is greenhouse drying. So here's one of the HFI members and me in there. I call it a greenhouse, but it, this is just a fully enclosed dryer with some vents. Uh, so I think in this case, there's some vents on one side of the dryer uh, drying room here. So you still, depending on the plastic that you use, you can get you know, plastics that allow transmission of different amounts of sunlight. There's special plastics made for greenhouses. So they, they um, allow sunlight to enter. One thing that that causes is the greenhouse effect, right? So you, you actually accumulate heat within the, the house. And so when you step into a greenhouse, usually you feel 
that it's warmer in temperature, you will also feel that it's more humid, right? Because you're trapping uh, the moisture within there, um, right? Higher temperature means we'll have more rapid evaporation of water, but it also means that the carrying capacity of water in the air is higher, right? So we can actually feel that it's more humid. And so I think that's important because we need to think back on those two modes, right? And how we actually do that drying at the interface. We need fresh, dry air coming in to carry away the moisture. So I'm, I think there, you know, there, there are ways that these can work, but um, sometimes when I've come into these and not necessarily Saeed's, I think maybe he had, you know, a decent amount of ventilation, but um, I could see these working well if it's a quite rainy area and you really need, you know, good coverage of the briquettes. Um, these are also nice because you can have multiple tiers of briquettes. You can probably be a little bit more space efficient, um, but you really need a means to remove the moist air and introduce fresh dry air. Um, if you do that at a rapid rate, then you're in addition to removing the moisture, you're also removing the heat, right? Because if you're taking the air out really quickly, you're actually pulling out the heat as well. So you may actually not have as much benefit um, from fully enclosed. So as you can tell, I'm not fully convinced that um, a fully enclosed greenhouse is a good way to dry. But there's kind of a nice compromise, which I'm sorry, that's not a great photo. I, I, could, I have some nice photos of this, but so this is um, green bioenergy in Kampala, uh, outside of Kampala in Uganda. And so in this case, it's hard to see, but so they only have a canopy or a roof over the top of the dryers. And other than that, it's open to the air. It's actually oriented in a, in a nice way where they do have a prevailing wind um, coming in, you know, generally in one direction in this area. And the, the dryers are, the canopies are aligned so that they sort of catch that wind and right. If we have wind, we have removal of moisture and introduction of dry air. We keep that concentration gradient of moisture, which drives uh, the drying. And um, so what, what they're able to do here, because they have good protection from rain, this UV treated plastic is resistant to the sun's harmful UV rays. That breaks down the plastic over time and would cause it to need to be put replaced. So they invested some more money, bought the higher quality plastic. Um, and then uh, so they still get some of that thermal effect from the sunlight, although any kind of plastic is going to block some of the sun's radiation, right? You can't have, um, not that I know of at least, uh, a plastic that allows 100% of the sun's uh, radiation and thermal energy to pass through it. So you're sacrificing a little bit of the thermal, but the convenience of having a cover um, is probably quite big, especially in a place where it rains a lot, like uh, Kampala. And in this case, they can actually uh, put their briquettes not even at a single layer. They, they kind of layer multiple layers of briquettes on top of each other. Maybe that extends the drying time a little bit. Um, but not significantly from what I've heard from them. So I think this is a nice compromise between the open sun drying and the greenhouse. So I have a couple more. These are kind of the, the more involved, but sort of industrial commercial scale. I've already talked about this one a couple of times, I think. So I'll go over it again. What it does nicely is it combines carbonizing or char making and drying. So this is uh, the Khmer green charcoal in, in Cambodia. Again, it was, you know, this is a more significant operation and investment and it takes power and, you know, access to decent materials and fabrication. But again, what happens here is the char making is happening 
heat generated from the T LUD carbonizers. Remember our carbonization talk um, a couple of months back. Heat that's generated is captured in these ducts. And there's actually a fan or a blower which pulls that heat and then pushes it, pulls it from the kiln, pushes it through a tunnel, a drying tunnel. So inside this tunnel are a bunch of racks of briquettes. And I forget the exact quantity, but it's, you know, a ton or a couple of tons of racks can fit into the tunnel. And so you have kind of uh, two sides to each tunnel, right? So there's a row of six or seven of these trolleys full of racks of briquettes. And over the course of a day or so, you can cycle those trolleys through the tunnel. And finally, here he's pulling those out. Um, the dry briquettes come out. And so this is great because you're taking advantage of this heat source, which often we waste. Um, and it's a significant waste. It's not easy to take advantage of. So this is the infrastructure you need to take advantage of it for drying. There's a big chimney on the back end, and that actually helps the pull flow. You get a, they call it the chimney effect, that pulls flow of heat through here. So this, this is really driving, you know, there's the thermal piece coming from the heat source from the carbonizer, but you also have the flow piece, right? The, the flow of that hot, in this case, it's not only air, it's also CO2 um, that's being generated from the flame here, being pulled through the briquettes. So they, they dry very well, they dry quite quickly. And um, I think it's a, it's a nice design, but it, obviously we know it took a lot. You could think about if you, know, you could make a little bit lower tech version of this. And I think it's possible. Um, I think the, the thing that makes this one a little bit complicated, it's the tunnel is not that complicated. This is just basically you know, iron sheet or sheet metal and then some insulation, right? So that could be, do, could be done. The thing that makes it complicated is this capture system. And so you could imagine actually, if you were able to position a T-LUD sort of underneath the tunnel, um, or maybe not even, you know, fully underneath, but only partially underneath, just so that you could have the T-LUD um, sort of blowing its flame right into the tunnel. Um, I think that you could do it without maybe the need for uh, these significant uh, motors and blowers, fans. So um, the last design, I think I haven't actually, this is, this is what big, big industrial briquette um, manufacturing uses. This is called the rotary dryer uh, or a rotary furnace. You could use these for a lot of different things. They're commonly used in mining and metallurgy. Uh, you'll have, you know, big lines of rotary furnaces. The way that it works basically is you have a conveyor, you bring your material. So in this case, um, this was not briquettes, but we could imagine bringing uh, wet briquettes up to the top and sort of dumping those into this furnace. And you'd have usually uh, a heat source being like a flame from either gas or if you're able to capture the carbonization gases, you could pump those in. This drum rotates and it's at, you can see it's at a small uh, incline. So as it rotates, the briquettes slowly pass. They fall through from one side to the other. And that incline and rotation are, are determined such that you get the time that you want the briquettes to be in there. So that's quite complicated. I have actually seen this at a little bit smaller scale. You know, people have tried to make something like this at smaller scale, but you need, you need multiple energy sources, thermal energy. Uh, you're not taking advantage of the sun really at all here. You need a, a fuel source and you need some mechanical, elect, usually via electric motors or diesel engines to rotate the drum. So. I won't go into this more, but once, you know, once uh, briquette operations are at a large 
quite large scale, this is actually a pretty common uh, method. So like in the US, we have the Kingsford charcoal plant. They use uh, rotary dryers um, for their operations, but that's many, many tons per day. Um, so I think those are all the examples that I have. There's a few resources uh, that D-Lab has put out related to drying. Uh, these are a couple of projects. So this, um, one of our students, Nicole Osmankowski, did a, a nice study of a solar dryer versus open air drying. So that's one. And then we had the open air dryers, some uh, investigation into some improvements in covering open air dryers. Um, by one of our, our teams in our classes. There's, I, th I think also Energypedia online has some good resources on drying and I can share that link also. But that's all I have for today. And um, yeah, thank you so much.